Thank you for tuning into the Golden State Media Concepts Bible Study Podcast. I'm your host, Sarah. Today we're going to be talking about texts from 2 Samuel and the Gospel of Luke. Before we get started with the Bible study, since this is our first episode, I wanted to tell you a little bit more about myself and my approach to this podcast. As I said, my name is Sarah, and I have a Master's of Divinity from Pacific Lutheran Theological Seminary in Berkeley, California. Try saying that ten times fast. I have been a Lutheran my whole life, and I have served in two Lutheran churches as an associate pastor. I'm not currently serving in a church, so I'm excited that I get this opportunity to explore the texts, read God's Word, and discuss topics that I'm passionate about. Now, as a Lutheran, I am used to following what is called a lectionary cycle. This means that the texts read in church each Sunday are on a three-year rotating basis. So each Sunday is assigned four readings, one from the Old Testament, one from the Psalms, one from the New Testament, and one from one of the four Gospels. So I thought that at least initially I would follow the lectionary texts for each week. Now, I'm sure I will go off lectionary at times, And I don't know that I will always hit all four readings every week, but for now, the lectionary seems as good a place to start as any. It gives us a cycle and a starting place, and at least you know where I'm getting my texts from, that my choices aren't completely random. So I'm excited to spend this time with you, and we'll get started on the texts and some follow-up right after this quick break. Want to find out what movies to go see? Then check out the GSMC Movie Podcast. It's your ticket to the latest movies, whether it's a new blockbuster event, romantic, comedy, or action flick. This show has got it all covered. They talk some what to go see now. Don't bother. What's hot on Netflix and everything in between? That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash movie dash podcast. When it's all about the movies, it has to be this new show. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. Welcome back to the Golden State Media Concepts Bible Study Podcast. As Again, I'm your host, Sarah, and we're going to jump right in today uh, with our reading from 2 Samuel. This first reading for today is from 2 Samuel in the Old Testament. Uh, it's chapter 11, verses t- verse 26 through chapter 12, verse 10, and also chapter 13, verse 15. It says, When the wife of Uriah heard that her husband was dead, she made lamentation for him. When the morning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. And the Lord sent Nathan to David. Nathan came to him and said to him, There were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb which he had bought. He brought it up, and it grew up with him and his children. It used to eat of his meager fare, and drink from his cup, and lie in his bosom, and it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was loath to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the wayfarer who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb, and prepared that for the guest who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. He said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. He shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing, and because he had no pity. Nathan said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I rescued rescued you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your bosom, and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little... I would have added as much more. Why have you despised the word? Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and have taken his wife to be your wife, and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house, 
for you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan said to David, Now the Lord has put away your sin. You shall not die. Nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child that is born to you shall die. Then Nathan went to his house. The Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bore to David, and it became very ill. So that's the Old Testament reading from Second Samuel. And after my initial comment about following the lectionary cycle, giving myself a place to start, this is the very first text that we encounter. Sometimes when we read the Bible, we encounter stories that are disturbing. We encounter stories that we don't know what to do with. And so let's start with a little background. What led up to these particular verses? It doesn't actually mention David's wife's name in these verses. It just refers to her as either David's wife or the wife of Uriah the Hittite. But if you're familiar at all with the story of David, then you'll remember that his wife was Bathsheba and that David saw her once when she was bathing and coveted her. So in order to gain her, he wanted her for his wife, he created a plan that sent her husband, Uriah, to the front lines of the battle of the war that they were currently involved in. And because he was sent to the front lines, he was killed. So in that way, David got rid of the person he saw as his rival, and he didn't do it. He could tell himself that he was not responsible. He simply sent the man, who was in fact a general in the army, he sent him to an assignment. And if he got killed, that wasn't David's fault, right? So that's what's led up to this. We start with Bathsheba crying bitterly over the death of her husband, and then boom, in the next verse, you'll, you see that after a period of mourning, gee, thanks, David, uh, David marries Bathsheba. I don't know what that period of mourning was. I don't know how long David thought it was appropriate to wait to marry the wife of the man he had murder, but he marries Bathsheba, and they end up having a son together. So at this point in the story, David has married Bathsheba. He thinks he's gotten away with having her husband killed. And then Nathan the prophet shows up. Nathan shows up and tells David this story about two men and their sheep. The one is wealthy. He has a large flock. The other is poor and only has one little ewe lamb, a ewe lamb that he treats as though it were his own daughter, a ewe lamb that it says uh, snuggles in his bosom. So he's very close to this ewe lamb. You can see that it's almost a pet. But one day a visitor comes to the wealthy man and the wealthy man doesn't want to take a, flock, uh, take a sheep from his own flock, as was customary for hospitality. You would serve your guest something from your own flock. So instead, he goes to the poor man. He takes the poor man's you. It's a terrible story. It's a sad story, which is why Nathan tells David, and David reacts perfectly. David says, this man is terrible. He needs to repay it fourfold. He treats it like it's an actual person in his kingdom, and he's uh, sentencing him. And, Dave, and then Nathan reveals that this is actually a parable. This is a metaphor for what David has done. He says, you are that man. And at this point, David actually confesses. He says he has sinned against the Lord. And Nathan says, because you have confessed, you will not die. Now, these stories are hard for a lot of reasons. Hard because David acts in ways that are inappropriate to our modern ears. Having Uriah killed, taking his wife. It's hard because we have Nathan, the prophet, coming and saying, you will not die, but because of what you did, your son will die. So what are we to do with these verses that then place the sins of the father onto the son? David confesses he does not lack consequences, but the consequences are for his infant son. For him as well, of course, I'm sure he mourned, I'm sure he grieved, but it's hard to read verses like this. And it's hard, especially in light of stories that are out there in the news these days. If your Facebook feed is anything like mine, I'm sure you've been seeing a lot of stories on the Stanford rape case, the swimmer at Stanford who was convicted of sexually assaulting an unconscious woman behind a dumpster. There's been a lot on my Facebook feed about 
the lightness of his sentence, the fact that he does not seem to be remorseful, the fact that he was more concerned about how this was going to affect his life as opposed to how it was going to affect the life of the woman that he assaulted. We're, we're, we encounter stories like this all the time. And one of the ways that we live as people of faith is that we live, one of the theologians said that we should live with the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. So here we have this story of David, which seems very timely. And where are we to take this? We have stories such as this that tell us that David confessed, but he gets off maybe lightly. We're not sure. I mean, it depends on how you feel about how what Nathan says to him. We encounter stories in the newspaper that make us angry, that make us feel helpless, that make us feel justifiably angry on behalf of the victim, maybe that make us feel justifiably angry that this man seems to not be facing the consequences that he should. So what we have to do is look at the text, see what we can take from the text. But we also have to remember that the text was written at a very specific time. And while we can take it and apply it to our daily lives, we can't just take it straightforward. We can't just take it and say wholeheartedly or just whole cloth, this applies to this situation. It never works like that. You have to read the, the text and then you have to interpret life through the lens of the text, not just taking it and applying it as though square peg round hole. So let's look at the text a little bit more. First, take a look and notice that the notice the lack of Bathsheba's voice throughout the rest of the reading. Women's voices are often silenced or left out of biblical narratives. And in light of this story that we've just talked about, we have to wonder, have things really changed so much? The voices of those who are victimized are still too often silenced or ignored. Stories like this one from Samuel are hard for a lot of reasons, but they also give us some good reminders to take with us in life. We have to take a quick break, but we'll come back. When we come back, we're going to talk about some of those reminders that we can take with us in life. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey! The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the Golden State Media Concepts Bible Study Podcast. Before the break, we were talking about the difficulties we encounter in life, the difficult stories we encounter in the Bible, how we can take one and apply it to the other. And we have to remember that there are always good reminders within the text of the Bible, within God's Word, that we can take with us into our daily lives. So first, stories and words from the Bible remind us that there are people in this world who don't have a voice for a variety of reasons. They remind us that those in power often get away with things that they shouldn't simply because of their place in society. We see in this story that the prophet Nathan stands up to David. David, who could have so easily have had Nathan killed for what he had to say, because David is, of course, the king. He is the most powerful, powerful person. And yet Nathan persists. Nathan stands up to him, even knowing that his life could be in danger because he is confronting the king on something he did that goes against God's word. This reminds us that we should have a voice. We have a voice and we need to use it, even in scary situations, even where we might feel powerless. If we have a voice, we need to use it on behalf of those who really are powerless. I'm grateful to people like the prophet Nathan, people who stand up for what is right, who confront systems of power, who speak the truth in love, who speak God's word into situations that are so difficult, so hard, so not easy to understand. 
And I'm also a little bit in awe of people like Nathan, and I know people like Nathan, because confrontation is not my strong suit. I firmly believe in standing up for what is right, for accompanying and standing with those who don't have a voice or who have less of a voice than someone else, but I'm not always good at actually doing that. I'm grateful for examples like Nathan because they remind me to have courage, to be brave, to speak the truth as I have been taught it. I'm re I'm I'm grateful for the people in my own life who do the same thing, who speak the truth, who stand up, who remind me to stand up, to remind me of what it looks like to speak God's truth to the world at large. So this story reminds us to use our voice, to use our voice in situations where people may not have a voice or where we can help those who need an advocate. This story also reminds us that we need to own our own screw-ups. Everyone screws up. David wasn't a great per person. He screwed up in colossal ways. I don't really have a lot of respect for the man as I read this story. I mean, despite his being famous and he was a powerful king, we ha he had an important place in the Old Testament. If you know your Old Test Testament and New Testament genealogies, you know that Jesus's line is traced back to King David. So he's important in a lot of ways. And yet, he wasn't perfect. He was clearly far from perfect. He does at least own up to his actions when confronted by Nathan. Nathan tells him this story about the man who kills the other man's sheep, and he is outraged on behalf of the man that he thinks is a real person. He doesn't simply send Nathan away or kill him in order to ignore what he, is, what he David, has done. He doesn't just sweep it under the rug and say, well, I'm the king, so it doesn't matter. I don't have to be subject to God's word. He actually says, I have sinned against the Lord. Yes, David could have taken it a step further. He could have said that he certainly sinned against Uriah. He's still sinning against Bathsheba, but we'll give a little credit where credit is due. He does confess. He does own up to sinning against the Lord. He listens to Nathan and he takes Nathan's words to heart. I'm not Still giving David high marks for much of anything in this story. He's still a lamentable person who did horrible things simply because he could. But he gives me a glimmer of hope in the fact that he does at least own his actions when confronted by Nathan. And he is forgiven, whether we think that is right or not. And frankly, I don't. But also, thankfully, I am not God. I don't get to decide who is forgiven, which is a good thing because I can hold a grudge like a lot of people. And so I'm very grateful that I am not in charge of deciding who gets forgiven and who doesn't. And so I know I can learn these lessons in my own life, both the need to repent as well as the reminder that ultimately forgiveness is not up to me. This story is still hard. This story is still difficult to read. This story isn't one that I want to put into a book and read at night before I go to bed, but it does help us to remember certain things. It helps us to remember to be a voice for the voiceless. It helps us to remember to confess our sins, to own our own screw-ups. It helps us to remember that God does call us to repent, that God does forgive us, but God does call us to repent. God says you need to own your own screw-ups. And this actually continues, this theme of repentance and forgiveness continues in the psalm for this morning. As I said earlier, that is Psalm 32, and we'll read that now. Happy are those whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Happy are those to whom the Lord imputes no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. While I kept silence, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not hide my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore let all who are faithful offer prayer to you at a time of distress. The rush of mighty waters shall not reach them. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with glad cries of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Do not be like a horse or a mule without understanding, whose temper must be curbed with bit and bridle, else it will not stay near you. Many are the torments of the wicked, 
but steadfast love surrounds those who trust in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. So that's Psalm 32. And the texts assigned for a given week in the lectionary don't always go together, but sometimes there are definite themes throughout them, and I really appreciate this psalm following after the Old Testament reading, because the psalmist reminds us how freeing confession can be. And sometimes this psalm is associated with King David's confession, although there's another psalm that's more closely associated with David. This psalm speaks of repentance and forgiveness. And the word repent actually means to turn back to God. When we sin, we turn away from God. We turn away from God's love. We turn away from God's word. We turn away from the things that we know God would want us to do. And so repentance means actually turning back to God. It's an actual act where we turn back to God, but we have to acknowledge that we've turned away in the first place. We have to understand that we have sinned and turned away from God in order to repent and turn back toward God. When we turn away from God, when we sin, sometimes we feel like God is ignoring us. Do you ever feel like you're being punished? That God is, you know, doing this to punish you in some way? I Sometimes we say, I don't know what I did. I just feel like God isn't anywhere near me. God is punishing me. It isn't God who is ignoring us. It's we who are ignoring God. God's love is still there, but when we turn away from God, we don't feel it. We don't know that God is still there, still loving us, still reaching out for us because we've turned away. We can't see it. And the more stubborn we are, the more stubborn we are about blaming God and God's lack of presence on God just not caring or God punishing us, whatever, the harder it can be to realize our own sin and repent. The harder it is to turn back toward God. We have to take another quick break, but when we come back, we're going to talk more about these ideas of repentance and forgiveness in both the Old Testament reading and this reading from Psalm 32. Stay tuned. Do you want to be healthier, yet you just don't know what to do? All these shows telling you this and that, but nothing seems to work. Well, listen close. Golden State Media Concepts has got something great for you. The health and wellness podcast dedicated to workout trends, healthy eating habits, diet, and everything about healthy living. Join us in our banters as we help you not just live life to the fullest, but live it to the healthiest. Welcome back to the Golden State Media Concepts Bible Study Podcast. We've been talking about repentance and forgiveness. We've been talking about confession and forgiveness. We've been talking about God's love in difficult situations. And when we're stubborn, when we refuse to acknowledge that we have done something wrong, it's easier sometimes to blame God, I think. It's easier sometimes to just say, no, this is God's fault. I'm not to blame. And as I was reading this week on some of the commentaries about today's readings, I read something from Catherine Schifferdecker, who is a professor at Luther Seminary in Minnesota. She's an Old Testament professor. She writes that this psalm, Psalm 32, is an apt description of the effects of guilt on a person, though this seems very dated in this day and age. She writes, we do not often talk about guilt or shame. Indeed, we do not see many examples of shame in our public figures. Too often, people in the public eye who are caught in moral or ethical sin exhibit less than sincere contrition, and they issue apologies that are not apologies, not I'm sorry, but I regret. And she makes a really good point. People don't want to, don't want to talk about guilt or shame. And I get that. I don't want to feel guilt. I don't want to feel shame. I, I often hear people talk about how they are a good person. I'm, I'm a good person. I don't want this guilt put on me for something that I did. But that's the stubbornness talking again. Do I want to feel guilty and ashamed because of something that I've done? Well, no, it's uncomfortable. I don't want to live in that uncomfortable space. It makes me feel like a terrible person. But sometimes 
we need to be reminded that we don't always do the right thing. This is where that speaking the truth in love comes into play again. Nathan reminds David that he didn't do the right thing. He comes to David and says, you have not followed God's word. You have done this horrible thing. He doesn't do it just to make David feel bad. He does it so that Nath so that David has the opportunity to repent. Sometimes we need to be reminded that we aren't doing the right thing. Is that comfortable? Is that fun? Of course not. And of course, there are those extremes where shaming can be taken too far for the smallest of infractions. There's always got to be balance in life. But we, as humans, screw up. And we need to own that sometimes. We need to actually say, I screwed up and I'm sorry. That is when forgiveness can happen. The psalmist reminds us that we need to feel those emotions. We need to really feel them, not just say, oh, well, I'm human, so sorry that you got hurt. But that's your problem. We often blame the victim. That's your problem. You feel that way. I don't have any control over that. But we do. When we hurt someone, when we take actions that have an effect on someone else, when we go against what we know we've been taught about God's love in the world, we need to own that. And this psalm reminds us what an amazing thing forgiveness can be. Notice that the psalmist is terrified before the psalmist has, has repented. There's this whole feeling of angst and insecurity and needing to hide. And then the psalmist confesses. And there's this wonderful freedom, this wonderful sense of God's presence and love that comes from just confessing what you've done, talking to God like a friend and saying, I did this. I acknowledge it. I ask forgiveness. Letting guilt or shame lead to taking responsibilities for one's actions or confessing what we have done can then lead to forgiveness. God is going to love us and forgive us no matter what. Now that doesn't give us free reign to then go through life not caring, not taking responsibility, saying, well, you know, I'm forgiven by God. I live in God's grace, so I'm going to do whatever I want because God's going to forgive me anyway. God's going to forgive us, but God doesn't call us to go out into the world and be jerks. God calls us to go out into the world and share the love that we have been given with our neighbors, with our family in God. We are all children of God. That makes us all brothers and sisters. Brothers and sisters fight. Brothers and sisters don't always get along. But God calls us to something bigger. God calls us to live in love with one another. So if we can move past our stubbornness, if we can confess to God, if we can turn back to God, then we will again feel that love that is always there. We'll again feel God's presence in our lives. It was always there. It never went away. But we turned away from it. Repenting means we turn back towards it. We turn back toward God. We say, I did this. I ask forgiveness. And God's love is waiting for us. Just like a parent, a good parent, because there are bad parents in the world, but just like a good, loving parent who's there when we come to them, who's there with open arms to say, I still love you. I still love you. You are my child, no matter what. This psalm, I think, is beautiful in how it talks about repentance and forgiveness. Now, not everyone is comfortable, again, with the idea of confession. As a Lutheran, we do confession each Sunday in church. We don't do personal confession. Churches like the Catholic Church still do personal confession, where you go meet with the priest and confess your sins. And there's something to be said about that, actually. There's something to be said about laying it all out there and saying, this is what I did. I feel horrible. But you unburden yourself when you do that. We do corporate confession in the Lutheran Church, which means that we can do, we do a confession of sins together during the, during the service. We don't say our specific sins. We speak a confession together. Usually it involves something along the lines of words such as, we confess that we have sinned against God. We have sinned against each other. We have sinned both by acting and by not acting, by speaking and by not speaking. We confess these things and then we ask for forgiveness and then we are forgiven. So we have two stories this morning, both from the Old Testament, the one from 2 Samuel and Psalm 32. We're going to actually do this podcast in two parts. So we'll do the, the New Testament version in the second part of episode one. That's all the time we have for the first part of episode one. I want to thank you for joining me for this time together. I want to remind you that we are available to download on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. If you want to know more about the whole family of 
Golden State Media Podcasts. You can t- you can go to our website at www.gsmcpodcast.com to find all of our wonderful podcasts. We have some great ones out there. We've got great hosts, and we would love for you to join us for those. So join me again as we move on this week, July, June, sorry, June 12th, to talk about the other two texts for this week from Galatians and from the Gospel of Luke. Thank you for joining me, and remember, you are a beloved and beautiful child of God.